Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Welcome back everyone to Fighting on Film. Uh, and today it's our Christmas special. So uh, Merry Christmas one and all. Um, we're joined as every week by Matt. Hi guys. And today we have a special guest, World War II TV's Paul Woodage. Hello. Excited to welcome, be Welcome Paul. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, yeah, we're delighted to have him on. We've chosen a cult classic for this Christmas. Uh, and it's 1978, The Wild Geese. We think it's an absolute belter. So when what's your earliest memory of the wild geese? Because I was thinking about this the other day, like Robbie asked me, like, how many times have you seen it? And I said, I must have seen it like at least a dozen times. It must be about 10 years ago, the first time I saw it. And I think I may have actually seen wild geese too first. Oh, dear. Poor man. <laughs> well, for me, it's for, I've seen it 50, 60 times. And in my situation, it's because I'm from Colchester, army town. So it was an absolute classic film for mm. people to talk about, not just the squaddies, but also students. And it seemed to be on every Friday night when you came back from the pub. <laughs> and my earliest memory of Wild Geese is actually people saying the only acceptable time for a man to cry is when Wafer gets killed at the end of the movie. That, that and, and when you get knocked out in the semifinals by the Germans. That, they're the only two times it is okay for a man to cry. And that was kind of a standard buzz thing. Spoiler alert, by the way, that, that went round, you know, in, in culture. So I, I would have been 10, 11 when I first saw it, which would have been probably about a two a year or two after it came out. So it would have hit, mm -hmm. it was cinema centre, so it would have been about, so actually it would have been older now, it would have been about 12, so about, probably about 1980. So that would have been, at my age, a big benchmark movie release. When that, when that was first shown on TV, it would have been a big thing with lots of, like when the Bond films came out. So there'd have been a lot of um, interest in it. And so, yeah, that would have been the first time. So I've been watching it for yeah, nigh on 40 years. It was free with the Daily Mail on Sunday and my mum and dad picked it up. We all watched it together and I'd never seen it. And my dad was going, oh, this movie's great, Rob, you'll love it. And I think I must be about 10, 10 years old, 11 years old. And I just sat there engrossed. I thought it was the best thing ever. Robbie's going to love this film full of old fellas shooting people and, and swearing and just having a cracking time in Africa. <laughs> knew, my dad knew me too well, I think. Um, <laughs> you know, the amount of weapons in it and the amount of action and all that good stuff um, with some of the greatest British stars of the time. It's an absolute treat to watch, isn't it, really? Yeah. I was trying to pinpoint what makes it such a good film, though. And it's hard to do. I think really, because there's a number of factors. You've got the great cast, you've got the amazing array of, of weapons on show. Yeah. The action sequences are really quite good. The plot's not bad either. I mean, the plots are great. It's like a yeah. double cross. There's some politics to it. There's a bit of Stuart Granger being a dodgy bastard. Um, you know, it's just, I, but it's difficult to like put nail down like one element of the film that makes it, you know, this, this, this called classic. To me, it's because it's self aware. To me, it's because it knows it is straddling a line between kind of where Eagles their silliness and mm. yet also making a kind of a semi-serious statement about politics in Africa. It knows mm. where it is. Mm. If you think of something like um, uh, The Monuments Men, for example, I know it's a completely different genre, but to me, that couldn't make up its mind if it was a comedy or serious. It was kind of... Yeah, it, was, I understand. it, it didn't yeah. sit in an area properly. The Wild Geese knows exactly what it is. It's mm. action, it's got a good cast, and it's straddling that line between silliness and realism. I think it's, yeah, self-aware would be my... Yeah, My and it has that whole um, sort of like political angle where it's trying to make a statement with that, you know, the speeches by Limbani, you know, where he's talking to her, um, to Kruger and you've got the despicable Stuart Granger who has a cracking set of, of glasses, I, I think. I'd <laughs> think about, I... Well, there's some there's some bad glasses in the oh, whole Richard yeah. Harris's. That, Harris you know... is wearing milk bottle tops, isn't he? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. You know, it's a bit unashamedly like a, a really high budget British B movie. It doesn't try and ham in any romantic subplots. You know, it's almost all A plot. There's no B or C plot here. It's right. We're going to go and snatch Limbani. Let's go. Well, you you also turn it off as soon as the plane takes off, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I do. I do, actually, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's how it should end. 
I, I want to like sort of dream that they all get back and it's all good, well, you the, know. The book does end there. Oh. Ah, I didn't know that. I've not actually read the book. The book actually ends, sorry, with them landing in, and I forget whether it is Rhodesia or South Africa, but they land at an airfield and that's it, mm. cut. There's no resolution. There's no, there's no, and it's different characters survive as cool as well. It's because uh, um, there, yeah. there are five officers in the book of only whom four get portrayed in the film. Right. One, and, yeah. and the Roger Moore, Sean Finn is an amalgamation of two. Mm. Um, and um, so, the, so the book does end differently without that resolution. See, I, I would prefer that. Just as a, a narrative structure, I would much prefer not I don't knowing. know. I, I quite like the fact that, you know, they have this cathartic, like, final showdown with, with Granger, oh, yeah. who's, you know, done them over so badly, got all these men killed, and he, you know, and eventually gets shot in the stomach by a little Beretta, I think, you know. <laughs> it's, it has a nice sort of, like, cyclical resolution as well. Like, it begins in London, it ends in London. It starts with the murder, ends with the murder. You know, there we go. Although it is silly in the sense that Stuart Granger does say to Burton... I've got a hit on you, you know, in every country. And yet yeah. he's able to go down to a public school, go see a meal without any protection and stuff. And you think he's going to get knocked off very quickly, isn't he? I mean, a meal just comes with a, with a, a Colt 45 out of his school blazer and just does in Burton. That's for dad, that is. Which would actually redeem the Emil character. It would, wouldn't wouldn't it? Yeah. In a weird way. He gunned down Burton. So, so uh, let's just talk about the cast for a little bit before we before we delve into the the action a little bit more. Um, mm. You've got Richard Burton as Faulkner; he's the the man in charge. Richard Harris as Rafer, sort of Faulkner's right hand man. Uh, Roger Moore as Sean Finn, who I think is just being James Bond the whole film, pretty much. I mean, why wouldn't you? He was Bond at the time. Witty, that their medic, played by Kenneth Griffith, and then you've got. Jack Watson from The Hill, who plays Sandy, the uh, the tough as nails CSM. And then just loads of little sort of character actors. Um, but one one we want to pay homage to today is uh, Ian Ewell, who unfortunately passed away a few days ago. But with the cast, you've got to, you've also got to address the fact that apart from Burton, the others was, were, in, in Richard Harris's case, he was third choice. So Bert, Bert Lancaster is, is there to be first. He's going to play Rafer, because Rafer is much older in the book. Rafer is like in his 60s. He's living in a kind of downbeat place in Britain. He's cut, he's, he's, there is an Emil, but Emil is in his 20s. Right. Um, and Bert better. Lancaster gets cast first. And then Bert Lancaster won't take second bidding to Richard Burton. So he drops out. Bob, Robert Mitchum comes in. And Roger Moore, I believe in his autobiography, which I have, says that he actually screen tested, I think, with, with Robert Mitchum. And then for some reason that fell out. And then Richard Harris came in as a last minute replacement. I think Harris is perfect for that, though. I yeah, think... no, that's it. Yeah, the irony is he's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, he is. I can't imagine Robert Mitchum in that role at all. I'm taking you skiing, kid. <laughs> can you? Ima- can, yeah, can you imagine him like being yeah. like, yeah, Emil, we're going to go skiing. I'm taking you skiing. Gonna- I'm, I'm, it just that doesn't play with me. No, but. no, no. And Stephen Boyd was going to be Sandy. Okay. Um, and he then he died or was ill, <laughs> one of the two. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jack Watson came in because Jack Watson had worked for Ewan Lloyd, the producer on, I think Ewan Lloyd was one of the producers on the Devil's Brigade or something. Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. And um, Jack Watson came in for that. And Jack Watson was was older than than the Sergeant Major was. So yeah, there was some right. casting. I'm being sort of geek there, but this is why you're on. The book is really good. And actually, mm. if you've read the book, Burt Lancaster fits the Jander's character of the book perfectly. He doesn't fit it because you've seen the movie where Richard Harris is given a different role in the sense that they adapt the role to fit to Richard Harris's age group and Emil becomes younger and he becomes yeah. kind of a kind of middle class English guy as opposed to he's meant because Rafer Jan as the original as written in the book, I think is Afrikaans. That would make sense from the name. You know, yeah, there's not many Irish chaps that call Rafer Janders, are there, really? Sean Finn, by the way, just to finish off, who's played by Roger Moore, isn't a friend of Faulkner's in the f- book. There's another officer called Jeremy Chandos, who is a friend of Faulkner's. They've been the Congo together. And Sean Finn's Roger Moore becomes the amalgamation of those two characters. And it's right. actually... And Faulkner dies beside Sandy in, in the village in the book. And it Damn. is... 
Chandos and Sean Finn. Sean Finn still pilots the aircraft, but he's just a pilot. He is literally just a pilot. Um, and then Chandos is the other officer. So there's five officers. Everything else is the same. Tosh is the same. The the, the, the Scottish sergeant, Ronald Fraser, is that the same role is there, but they just they they knock out one one officer for whatever reason. Budget, possibly, because paying for Hardy, Flow, Hardy Kruger yeah. or Deadly Luger, as Roger Moore refers to him in his autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> I, had to, I had to work with Deadly Luger. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a great nickname. It was a shame a looking Luger. for Deadly Luger. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it works so well, the casting, because they're all, you know, Burton and Harris are, are serious actors. Um, Burton was a, a Shakespearean a Shakespearean thespian. So to see him do this, this B-movie plot, I think it's just, it adds so much gravitas. Burton chooses to act it really straight-laced. So does Harris. Moore's just having fun, I think. Yeah. And it, it all just comes across, as, it just comes across really well. Yeah, and they do play off one another quite well mm. as you well. Can t- you can tell they're all drinking, buddies, especially Burton and Harris. Like they play off each other really well. Yeah, like, they do. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you feel like there is a prior relationship, and they've known each other for years. Mm. I think, I think you're, we're, we're referring it to it as a B movie, which I think is perfectly fair. But you have to go back to that time when that when you and Lloyd bought the book rights from Daniel Carney. That book had been an international bestseller. They spent a lot of money for the rights for the book. And the only reason I would argue it became a B movie is it didn't do well in America. And it was to do with the fact yeah. it only got shown in about 10 theaters as opposed to, to, to because of some licensing deal. Mm. Um, I don't think it was intended to be a B movie. I mean, it was certainly the, the, that, that cast that you talked about, Robbie, was an exceptional cast. Oh, for God, yeah. yeah. It's crazy yeah. cast. Yeah. Um, and the budget's there, though. You know, it's not yeah. like they skimped on the budget. No. You know, no. the, the, the bridge scene where the... Um, um, the, the the aircraft strafes the convoy, you know, and yeah. we get at least ten minutes of Bedford truck RL. on fire. Bedford RLs. RL, there we go. Not already QL, RLs there. I've been QLs. I mean, RLs. There. Wasn't a Q. I was like, Rob, is that a Bedford QL? I was like, no. It's He's not disappointed. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> you know, that's a big cast. There's a three lead, three four lead actors. They're all big names. Yeah, I suppose it's a little unfair to call it a B movie when at the time it was made as probably like you know a big action blockbuster. Yeah, yeah, a blockbuster expected to do well. I mean, I mean, just how much would Roger Moore have cost? Exactly, at the height of his Bond peak. How much would it cost now to get Daniel Craig to appear in your movie in the not top in the not top role? I mean, if that's yeah. what we're talking about, how much would it have cost to have got Sean Connery and so you know so. I, I and Richard Burton wouldn't have come cheap, although he no, had. No. In fact, his, his his last actual box office success was where Eagles Dead made lots of lots of movies. In seventy four, he famously made The Klansman with Lee Marvin, where he was so drunk they had to put most of his scenes sitting down because he couldn't stand <laughs> up. He, he was he was better by the time of Wild Geese. So, and Richard Harris was on the wagon as well for that. But even so, they would have cost a lot of money. Hardy Kruger yeah. was doing well. He'd have cost. Yeah, a lot he was, of money. yeah. They threw a lot of money at it. Made quite a bit of money as well. I think it made a, at least over four million. I think so. It did, it did make really money. Well internationally, did well in Japan, did well in um, did well in Africa. I mean, yeah. and that and famous and that we mustn't neglect, of course, because we're British centric. That. Uh, Winston Shona and John Carney were incredibly, incredibly successful South African actors. Mm. Had to be really convinced to do it because they were worried about racial stereotyping and negativity course, yeah. and English people making a move about South Africa. But they were and are. I mean, John Carney's still with us. Winston died two or three years ago. They are were incredibly well regarded actors. I mean, we yeah. wouldn't have known them as a British audience back then. But in South Africa, they they were they were Lawrence. It was like they're getting a Lawrence Olivier and John Gielgud. That's mm. they were Shakespearean on there, you know, highly regarded. They, they'd had a stage show that had won all sorts of Tonys and awards and stuff for years. So we mustn't disregard them because yeah. they're, they're not known to our audience. But they were huge. Let's not forget Stuart Granger as well. Yeah, you know, no, he's not a no name. That's that's a great little part for him to play. You know, he plays that really well. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that I, I found out yesterday, Patrick Allen, who plays Rushton, the military advisor, he narrated Tugs. And that, I loved that when I was little. So I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's just like, it's such a nice for little the, touch. For the international audience, Robbie, what's Tugs? Uh, it's a it's like Thomas the Tank Engine, but it's sea. That's the best way to, to So they're basically it. talking tugboats, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. But he, he was the narrator. <laughs> uh, and like, idiot, I went mad when I found that out. I couldn't believe it. He was also, more interestingly for me, the, he was the narrator of all the what to do in the nuclear war fallout videos I was shown at school. Was he? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Protect but, and survive and, ones. And, and, 
and you will be having to shit in a bucket and keep that bucket <laughs> in the other room and take your no seriously we had to what i'm older than you guys we had to sit and watch those at school and that was patrick allen i'm glad they didn't put that in tugs <laughs> i'd have been mortified <laughs> <laughs> oh, the nuclear warning episode yeah yeah <laughs> Oh god. Um, We've got to tug these old US Navy ships out to this atoll for some testing. <laughs> <laughs> what why is my hair falling out? said the tugboat. <laughs> <laughs> So plot-wise, um, the film basically revolves around a group of mercenaries. They are tasked by a businessman with rescuing a, a former president of, a, of an African republic that has been kidnapped and held by his political rivals. Richard Benn uh, plays uh, Colonel Faulkner, and he basically organises this a rescue mission um, with uh, old comrades in arms. Yep. A lot of them ex-British military, ex-South uh, African military double hard bastards basically they they get double crossed and the mission gets scrubbed but they aren't told it's been scrubbed and they are left on an african runway in the middle of nowhere simply holding their duty free waiting and wondering what the hell they're going to do next and then that's that's where the main action ramps from there doesn't it and then absolute bloody havoc kicks off from there. it does they, richard harris tries to instill a civil war um yep why don't we just simply start a civil war alan why <laughs> you know? I'll give it to you practically, and I'll give it to you emotionally if I have to, or the other way around, he says. Yeah, yeah. Before all that, they, they have this absolutely amazing training sequence where Sandy just... Sandy absolutely beasts them, doesn't he? Oh, God. Oh. Sandy, Sandy's character in, in that like that bit where he shouts, like, right then, let's try for our first fucking heart attack, shall we? And he gets all these like mid-40s veterans to like run around and throw themselves on the floor. Yeah. And, you know... Probably the best training montage of any like military film you'll see, I think, really. And Richard Burton is is sweating out every single drink he's ever had in his life in that in them sequences. Isn't yeah, he? it's that mm. scene's single handedly like cleaning up Burton and Harris at that point. You know, this is where you get to know the the, the crew a little bit better. So you, you get to know Witty and, and, and Tosh and you know all the rest of them. It is an ensemble, but it's more directed at Harris Moore and Burton. You still get a lot of character development with, with Witty and and Sandy and that. And th these are actual people. They've got hopes and dreams. They've got actual character arc, which is really nice for a film like this because it could have just done away with any of that and just had the main stars. They're more beloved in a way because they're such small yeah, parts it, of the it film. Yeah, it links to the character quite well, especially that uh, that scene that precedes it, where they're you know they're being recruited and they're they're all like in that pokey little flat. Someone's hanging around cups of tea. You know, they're all being interviewed, and you know that's when you first meet. Oh, just like killing, sir. <laughs> yeah, you know, what I do best? <laughs> what do best? I'm a plumber now. I don't really fit me. <laughs> the beautiful scene where Burton goes to interview Jack Watson in his garden. Well, the oh. fucking rose bush is barred, my friend coming on and whipping into shape nicely. That's just a great scene. It is. Um, and again, I don't want to be the geek who's read the book, but Virgin Art, that's in the book. The Please book, do. there's no beasting, there's no running around. They're accepting the fact they're older. They're in for Africa for a lot longer. There's a whole romantic subplot. Both Sean Finn and the other Jeremy officer have 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 women in town. There's one's called Gabrielle, blah, blah, blah. And they they kind of make the point of saying, we don't need to do running around. We're not going to be doing that. We're going in after two hours, come back. Just It's as long yeah. as the men can shoot, hold their rifle. So that, that that's an interesting thing they must have developed for, I think, that reason of giving people some character development mm. and, and some investing some emotion behind it. And I think... You know, it, we, you know, you you took apart the Battle of the Bulge film twice. Yeah, a longer running time, yeah. but you have much less investi investiture is that the right word? in the characters because you don't. Yeah, care. it's just good writing, isn't it? Really. Yeah, you care about Jock, you care about Tosh, you care about Witty and Gennaro and all those guys, even though they only have two or three lines each. This, it's just, it works. It just works. So, Paul, you having read the book and know quite well, does the book begin with that whole mob? subplot the beginning bit with it Sean does, Flynn. except it's Janders, not Sean. The the, the mob thing is all in there. It's just it's Janders. The much much more of the book is about the actual simply mechanics of how you set up an operation in a foreign country. They decide to for example when we get to Kit later in the in the in the book they use Russian weapons and there's some 
reason why if they get killed, they'll think it's something come from been mounted from Soviet controlled country. Right, right. And they talk much more about how they get the weapons there. Whereas in the film, they're all using SLRs and wearing British Army cap badges. Yeah, setting up of, of how they do all that, mm. which the movie just skips. You know, well, you just it, I can out. imagine that wouldn't be very interesting for, for the you know the average movie goer, but you know, we'd find that interesting, obviously. You know, that sounds really fascinating. So the dogs of war by contrast, has half an hour action at the end, if not even 20 minutes. Mm. And the whole middle part of the movie is just signing contracts, hiding Uzis inside oil drums in Dogs of War. Yeah, but the Wild Geese, the film doesn't do any explanation of how they get all these people because they explain at the beginning that Richard Burton shouldn't be even be in the country. So how do you get mercenaries? How do you get yeah. them... How did they go to Africa? What did they have to have jabs? Did they, you know, I, <laughs> the, the book covers all that. The book covers the minute eye of how you set up a military operation or coup. It's a coup, isn't it, effectively? Because me and Matt were saying as well, you, you mentioned the, the Russian firearms in the book. Roger Moore, or, uh, Sean Finn, kills an East German officer, right? And I'm thinking, yeah. well, hang on. If, if the East Germans managed to pin this back to a, a British, like ex-British serviceman, it could trigger World War Which III. Which you would think they would do, given yeah. like all of the, the dead mercenaries wearing British Army cat badges. Which, which, again, the book does all cover that. The book does all go into detail explaining East Germany's relationship and South Africa's influence and so on. So it's those little inclusions that I, th I thought, well, they're probably like holdovers from the book, but they aren't being explained here. But, but they make nice little things to notice when you watch, I think. Yeah. You know, you go, oh, there's a there's an East German Air Force officer. Oh, there's a there's a Cuban military advisor, you know, and make the film a more enjoyable watch, I think, especially for, for geeks like us, I suppose. You know, they, not all of them make it back, do they? Which is a bit, it's a bit of a shame. No, well, like Paul was saying there, like, uh, the, you know, the only acceptable time to cry is when Rafer gets it. Like, I don't agree with that. I think it's it's, it's when Sandy gets oh. it, that's when it does it to me. I'm like, oh, I just can't Sandy. take that. It's just, <laughs> oh, it just, oh, it just stabs right at the heart. It's just, no, not Sandy. <laughs> Except in the book, again, he's an unlikable shit in the book, Sandy. Uh, Sandy literally only loves one person. It's you know, the, the book says something. I've, I've got it written down here. I had it written down here. Sandy, who had so little love in him that all he had he reserved for Faulkner. Everybody hates him. He has no rapport with the men. Uh, the you know, he is just there because he's a hard bastard. He does love Faulkner, mm. but of course, with Jack Watson playing him, he just even though he's a hard ass, he's just got that. You know, when he insists on going on the mission, you know, most of all, I love you. Know, that that yeah. is perfect. You want to see a revolution? <laughs> Just fucking stop me! It's yeah, exactly. It's like little scenes where he's like he's having his uh, his, his gammon and chips in the in the mess, and they're all going off into town, and yep. he's just like smiling, watching. He them. gives him a little glance, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, nice little scenes like that, you know. And Jack Jack Watson, being the actor he is, he conveys that beautifully, yeah. you know. I've never seen anyone more angrily fire a sterling than him. Sandy on a sterling, my god! Oh. Wouldn't, you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to be anywhere near that, would you? Didn't even need the stock, you know. He, he point shoots it the whole way through. He's got it centre mass. Because even when, when Sandy does get shot and he shouts Alan, earlier in the film, Faulkner said, look, when, when you're not around, you don't have to call me sir, you can call me Alan. And he chooses to, to say his name with his dying breath. You know, I think it's quite, it's quite sweet, really, in a way. Yeah. It's like, oh, he, he is like, he's his best mate. <laughs> you know? it, it's, tra it's tragic. Like, it, it is. That just, I, yeah, I think that has a lot more emotional impact for me than, than Janders' death. Yeah. Although obviously they they over egg the setup of that massively with a meal. Oh, we get, we have to talk about a meal, don't we? Now with with a meal, you know they're, they're setting up this this young lad who's um, expecting a skiing holiday, but doesn't doesn't get one because his dad's got to go off and start a, a civil war in Central Africa. Yeah. Those scenes don't really um, work for me. Like, no. Harris is comes off as a bit too cloying. I think it's because we don't care about a meal. It's because a meal's an annoying kid. I think that doesn't help. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's Yahoo! Yeah. Meal is annoying. Oh, I know. God, that... Oh. But is he more or less annoying than the kid in Jurassic Park who doesn't jump off the fence? I mean, they're tight there. Mm. Who then becomes... Who then becomes... In the Pacific, he then becomes um, Eugene Sledge, doesn't he, that kid? But <laughs> they are my two most annoying kids in movies of all time. Emil and the Jurassic Park kid. I think Emil's got to come out first. On it's those. Emil. It's Emil. Yahoo! Yeah. Oh, Yahoo! Just... Oh. Yeah. Hello, sir. God. Thank you, sir. Hope to meet you later, sir. Emil, can you can you do that again, please, Emil? Can you actually put some emotion in those shots? Thank you, sir. 
Oh, just fuck it. Go. Just put, print it. It's fine. Let's go. Oh, his delivery's awful. I hate it. It takes me out of every scene he's in. He's, he's quite clearly and there to me. joining us as our special guest is Paul Spurier, <laughs> who played Emile. <laughs> special guest, a plank of wood. <laughs> With slightly more emotional range. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, God. But, I mean, I do, I do enjoy Harris's character outside of those scenes, especially, you know, the, the scenes with Burton, they're great. The this, this scene where they go and rescue Flynn and he's like, what What are you carrying, Rafer? And he, like, pulls out a hand grenade and a stub nose Smith, Smith & yeah. Wesson and he's like, balance. Yeah. <laughs> it's just Balances like, me out. It's just a great scene where he punches a grenade through the door. Like, if that was me, I'd end up, like, breaking a knuckle and not going through the door and then be just, like, stuck with a hand grenade. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, Richard oh, Harris... I thought it was going to be that door. Ow. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I think to, to Harris, you see, to me, is he's the heart, isn't he? And he's the conscience, I suppose, more than the heart. Yes. In that he is getting across to the audience that that mercenaries can also have objectivity. They can also be sympathetic. And Faulkner says that. He's like, you know, I, I, would, I, I, I don't care whether I'm fighting for the good guys or the bad guys, as long as the check doesn't bounce kind of thing, you know? And Hardy Kruger wants his farm in South Africa. So he's kind of, you know, when he says, you know, I wonder which one of us is, is more morally, you know, um, straight in yeah. this. And so, so to me, Harris is the, is the conscience of it. Um, and, um, and, and therefore, that's I do find his death more moving because he genuinely has invested himself in, in bringing yeah. um, Limbani back to his people. Whereas the, uh, most of the 50 men are just there for the paycheck. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. We've all done stuff just for the paycheck, but Harris is also, that's why he gave up Emile's holiday. It's because of the principle, not the weight, not the money. Burton is the star, he's the focal point, but Harris is the, is the, uh, the emotional the center of the movie. Yeah. What about Kruger's death? Do you, what, do you think, what do you think about that? Because obviously he has this epiphany where he, you know, he, he talks to Lynn Barney and he, he says, you, you, that makes sense to me. You make sense to me. Yeah. I'd like to find out what that future can be like you know that kind of that kind of sentiment he, he's adamant that he's going to carry limbani yeah on his back constantly yeah. and then there's that super alley moment where he does like a he like does a reload while he's got a man strapped to his yeah, back and then jogs cool down yeah. a, a river a dry riverbed and takes out like five or six simbas with his 60 round magazine yeah <laughs> i mean i mean hardy kruger took the film on because he was a great lover of africa and he had written a novel set in Africa two years earlier that would had geese in, in, it was in a German title, but it was referencing geese. And he said there was some kind of fatality when this Fate. movie came to him that it was meant to do it. But he always said afterwards, and Hardy Kruger is still alive, you know, he's 92 now, but he, do, he did say that he felt his scenes with Limbani were rushed. There was lots more they filmed, that the mm. journey was, that, that was longer physically there was more instance on the way in the bush mm. and also there are more conversations he felt it all got a bit rushed and i think from my point of view his death it, it it's moving but i feel the whole he's gone from complete racist bigot to champion of the of the black race and it takes 10 minutes it's too quick yeah, it, yeah. It, it's very fast Where he's being won over by limbani's you know logic and political ideas they're all modern 21st century people who use twitter we know that you don't convert people from being an overt racist with one mm -hmm. well-polished quote on twitter it's gonna twote, take yeah. years and yet mm. within within 20 minutes of being cut off from the rest of their unit they're running through a bush have a bit of water and suddenly he's seen the light and he's you know it's it's I can I understand that's that 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 was the important part of it, and that's why the two black actors took the film on because they were going to be out, given an opportunity to get some messages. Across. But to me, it's it's too rushed. The whole thing is too rushed. So therefore, I feel that Hardy Kruger, when he, he when he buys it, I, I would have liked to have seen a bit more of a journey before he buys it. I think you're right, but it's a testament to both those actors that you get enough from that interaction to know where they were going. Yeah. With it. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of nice dialogue in those scenes as well. Um, a lot of nice back and forth anyway. You know, I, I like the redemption. It was a bit quick, but it was mm. nice to think that, you know, this double R, you know, ingrained racist who's, who's killed hundreds of people, I assume, up to this point, he could come out of this mission a changed man, which I thought, actually, that's not a bad message for, for a 70, 70s yeah. movie to make. It's quite a bold message, I think, as well, um, for the time. 
and, and again, the context of the movie, they, they, it was the because you know, apartheid was still the system in South Africa. Mm-hmm. They filmed it, they all stayed mm-hmm. on a resort. Uh, African, British all stayed in the same accommodation. They paid union rates, they, they got permission to do all that. They, they, they made a very bold statement of equality about when they made the film. And they were ha- and they had strong African characters with heart, with who intelligent. And as you say, in the 70s, that's not necessarily how, how Africa was portrayed in, in your average movie. There was a lot of progressiveness for that movie, really. Yeah, it's progressive. Its clunky way of explaining it. The dialogue is a bit, but actually, for the for its time, it was really well written. Yeah, yeah. And there's not a lot of films attempt. There's there's not a lot of blockbuster films attempting to do anything like no, that no. really at that time. I mean, I, I think. I mean, it's not my show. I think we should now address Kenneth Griffith's homosexual character because I find that fascinating. Because it's yes. both progressive and also completely cliche at the same time. It's, it, it it's is, somehow yeah. because he's kind of a Larry Grayson camp figure. Yes, yet, he does have that 70s gay shtick. Except he, his being gay is not central to the plot. If you look at other movies that, cons- that, that featured homosexuality in the 70s, the being homosexual part of it was what drove the plot. His being homosexual mm. is accidental to the plot, and he is a kick-ass hero who goes down in a in a in oh, a, goes in, a, fighting, in, a in a scheme yeah. of machete blade. And so he is a cliche, but he is he is he's a noble, strong character who who is an equal of his men around us. So it's it's a strange paradoxical, as I say, progressive mm. and yet at the same time cliche. It's just who he is. Yeah. None of the other characters are judgmental about you know mm. about it you know and he has a laugh with them he's like yeah uh who's who are you sending your will to a lovely proctologist and he's like what's that and he's like it's a bum doctor darling you know and he's like yeah <laughs> chubby <laughs> cheeks, yeah chubby yeah. cheeks <laughs> i'm sure you know y- younger people watching it might be offended by that portrayal but i think it was quite a brave choice it's interesting it's of its time but i don't think we can dismiss it as just say oh they got it all wrong there i think it was no. it was it was trying to do the right thing he's my, one of my favorite characters in it i i love witty in yeah it. He's, he's one great. of mine too because yeah. he, he provides some much needed comic relief parts you know he he's very important to the plot anyway because without him they can't look after limbani when they're on the move because he's the medic exactly um you know he's very sincere in it in his in his acting as well when some lads are injured he just he has this look that he gives faulkner and he's like oh yeah. these lads aren't gonna make mm-hmm. it sort of thing you know he he actually he cares and then when he does go down in a, a blaze of glory he goes out fighting like an absolute champ two uzi mags and a knife yeah fight. exactly he could have reloaded i think in the time that bloke took to saunter over to I mean, him maybe he'd run out robbie the young expected to be there for four hours and no no buggers wearing ammo oh, pouches they're not, they? sure. no, maybe he only took two mags with him bless him yeah, like I think Faulkner lands and he's he's wearing basically just a smock and a and a and a, and a belt. That's it. Have you noticed though? The interesting thing is, I'm pointing out a plot hole. They're crossing back over the river. It's either a different river or they they've already crossed because they cross from right to left over the bridge, right? The the the, the dry bridge where the plane <laughs> oh, comes. Oh yeah, they do. Fucking but hell, yeah. when when Burton and 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 they leave, they're crossing from left to right, so they're going the wrong way across the river. <laughs> it's, every time I watch it, it bugs me. They're, they're trying to fool the Simbas there, Paul. I think. Maybe you know, because you know, in Lawrence Arabia, uh, David Lean always had the action going from left to right, didn't he? That was a conscious decision to do that. But yeah, the, I mean, famously, I, I've yeah. seen the dry river; you can't see which way the river's flowing, but. They do. They are unable to cross from the right hand bank to the left hand bank. But later on, they're on the left hand bank and they're getting to the right hand bank. So th- it just doesn't make sense. Maybe maybe that was a conscious decision by the director to impart some confusion. Uh, maybe it could be that. Let's talk about the um the execution of the plan. The when the when the force lands by parachute, which by the way, that's free fall is just one of the most amazing scenes. We'll talk about our favorite scenes, I guess, later on. But anyway, then Burton's unit goes off to the uh to the, the barracks, blah blah blah, crossbow, crossbow, cut, 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 in rescue, rescue, sh- gas, gas, go, escape, escape. Roger Moore does the airfield, airfield, grenade, blah, 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 blah. They're acting like absolute perfect precision, everything's and then once they get the bridge, they all become idiots on their first day on the parade for a while. Because when, when across the, the bridge. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, see, that bit gets on my tits, right? Because Richard Harris shouts from the safe side of the bridge. He shouts, there's not time because the aircraft will be back, right? And I timed it. I timed it last time I watched it. Because that's, oh, wow. when, that's when Richard Burton does that, looks at Witty, and there's two guys who aren't going to make it. Who's going to do it? I'm going to, uh, uh, yeah. Like three minutes elapse at this point. There's plenty of time yeah. to duck down the riverbank, cross over the dry creek, get back and get in the truck with with Rafer and, and Jack Watson and all that, and they go off. That plane's at this point radioed back their location. <laughs> yeah. Because that's the that's the last vehicle. There's a convoy of what? There's like three RLs. There's a there's a Land Rover. Yeah. Or is it a Land Cruiser? A couple or something? of snatches. Yeah. And that's the last vehicle, isn't it? And in it is your commanding yeah. officer, your medic, your objective, and you at the back. You put that in the middle of the convoy, surely, don't you? Don't you? You would, yeah, you would. Yeah. So why is that at the back and gets cut off? Because <laughs> it's the three of the main characters in a in a jeep and they've all wearing plot armor. It's Burton and Chris. There's two of the four officers. The medic, the objective, are in the vehicle at the back that gets cut off. Yeah, I'm sorry that that and I I'm saying that as a huge fan of the movie. That bit every time I have to overcome this hurdle of why didn't they just get in the middle of the con? It just makes no sense. Why didn't Why didn't they push the truck that broke with down the with the Land Rover? Oh no, hang on, lads. We need to wait for this plane to go over. Hang on. Oh, oh God, no! It's it's <laughs> it's strafing us. Oh it's no! Plot holes. What a shame. Plot holes big enough you can drive an RL through, isn't it? I love the film to bits, but that bit there, the whole river bit, just you know, crossing the river twice the same direction, and then and get being isolated. Yeah. And also, if we're on that subject, because because Ray, Rafe is it with the map, and it's, we've still got another two hours to go, right? They they talk about saying about two hours to go, and yet somehow, though they've been driving, <laughs> they all meet up down the riverbank. How how fucking far have Burton and Kruger walked through the bush? I suppose if you have got Simbas on your tail, you, you're going to move quick, aren't you? Maybe, possibly. <laughs> Who knows? So on on that bombshell, we <laughs> should we move into the alley tally? Yes, let's, let's plenty to talk about there. You have a complete plethora of small arms. Everything from Mark One Brens to Sig P two tens, Browning High Powers, Uzis, Madsen M fifties. You get it. I'm, I'm older than you guys, and I, when I used to watch that movie back in the day, we had no means of looking shit up and going on the internet and looking at stuff and free. You had to just kind of look and what, and you'd go, "What was that thing?" And every, the score yeah. D conversations was, of course, Tosh's cut down, shortened SLR, but you didn't ever see it long enough on screen to get an idea of what the hell it was. And it was always a topic of conversation: "What the hell is he carrying there?" And I've now, of course, with the internet movie weapons database you can look it up and go all right so custom l1a1 slr with a 40 round mag blah 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 that that ian yule's character l4 brand mag yeah um 40 round mag. so but that was the thing that for i mean i I mean for 20 years of my life i didn't know what that weapon was because you never got a good enough shot of it and every time you watch it you try and get that i still can't see what it is so that is my pick of the kit because it just it took me so long to work out what the hell it was that's a great choice because, I mean, even though we have the the internet now and we can find out what it is, it's still one of those guns where you go, damn, that's cool. Mm. What the hell's that? You know, when you watch it for the first time. And, you know, it's not just the gun either. It's got an OEG uh, collimator sight, yeah. which is a very early sort of like optic, red, uh, red dot optic that basically tricks the brain into superimposing a red dot. It's not an optic per se. It's, a, it, it's, it's just a, a, a light tube that tricks your brain into superimposing a red dot over what you're looking at. For years, I think it was everyone assumed it was um some some sort of prototype from South Africa yeah. like a uh like one of their files cut down but apparently not apparently it came from a UK armory but I want to know what your choices are cuz cuz you're the weapons guys so what's your choice Matt well i mean obviously my choice would also be the cut down slr but there's so much to talk about in this film like the beginning scene with um Roger Moore where he pulls out that Sig P210 you just know the rest of the film is going to be good from there because how often do you, do you see a Sig P210? You just don't, and that's a very, very, you know, very cool pistol to have. You know, it's it's not it's not all the PPK cool, but it's pretty cool, you know, and it's a definite stylish choice. It's an elegant gun, but yeah, you've got all kinds of really really alley kit in there. You've got that Vickers that pops up that you don't, you know, where the hell did they get that from? There's a couple of honourable mentions. Got to, got to give a shout out to the Mark 1 Bren. Yes. Yeah. That makes a, makes a few, you know, it's got the drum sight. It's, you know, it's 
it's the original, the OG. It's in in uh, 303. Everyone else is, you know, operating firearms in 762 NATO, and there's a, just a, a random 303 Bren. So that must have been an ammunition nightmare for them. <laughs> um, but I think I think one of the standout things is the blindy side anti tank weapon that pops up at the that end. They load the mortar round. And- <laughs> Yeah, that they load with a mortar round, which is yeah, that's that's. Uh... Give me it with a bazooka. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just that whole like um, village set piece is just so good. Right. You know, Wait. you get that. You get Wait. the sim. You get Wait. the simbas. <laughs> fire! 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 <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, it's so good. You got you got Esposito with the Bren, and and Sandy just like yeah, we're we're, we're waiting until like they're right on us. Harris is on the Vickers on the, at the edge of the airstrip just absolutely mowing down the finest the finest soldiers this african republic has to offer he kills about 50 60 because i think there's a there's a kill count video out there on youtube all oh, right yeah and ironically harris gets the most kills out of anyone in the whole film with the victim mows him down then he gives him a belt full <laughs> what about you robbie well loads really you could go on forever but i uh, firstly i love the the dpm smocks and the dpm fatigues they wear with mm. 37 pattern webbing i quite like that i think that's quite alley um and dms dms yeah I, I really like hardy kruger's kruger's crossbow i think it's great which would make a good beer name wouldn't it hardy hardy kruger's crossbow so, it's, it's not like a seven per strength strength ipa yeah. isn't it I'd drink that. <laughs> if you saw that in a shop, you'd buy Hargit Kruber's crossbow. Indie you? brewery around and making that. There's got to be just a couple of lads like going, what can we call this This new beer? Well, I watched, watched Wild Geese last night. What about Hardy Kruger's crossbow? Only the best mercenaries drink Hardy Kruger's crossbow. <laughs> 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 I love the way it's set up. You know, they go, we need to kill a man silent. And he goes, I know something that I can use. Crossbow, kill a man at 300 yards. Go straight through a man. And they, they attach poison to it because it'll go straight through a man. And also, interestingly, how they don't solve that problem till they get to Africa. <laughs> no. so Ray, Rafe was the planner. He's got the map. And they go, oh, shit, we've got to get rid of those guards, haven't we? What if Hardy <laughs> Kruger hadn't come up with a crossbow? Yeah. They'd already got to Africa by then. Surely that kind of was central to the whole mission. Yeah. To me, that's a sort that one out in London before you get on the plane one. You know, it's, it's maybe, maybe that's maybe that's something that can only be solved in Africa. Possibly. Problem. Maybe it's like we need a, we need an African problem solver for this you one. To get the crossbow from <laughs> Durban, so possibly. Yeah, but that is definitely in Africa. They have that conversation. Yeah. They're already there. They've got the yeah. plan. And I mean, I'm surprised they didn't actually get to the edge of the fence. Go, oh shit! How we we said we were going to get rid of those guards. How are we going to do it? Oh shit! You know. They could have used Roger Moore's silence pistol, couldn't they? Push comes to shove. Yeah, that's alley kit on its own. That's that's a, a suppressed Wolf P thirty eight with a cut down mm. barrel. Very nice. Mm. And the the mm. Simbas as well. They're quite alley with their denizens and the the para fouls they've got. Peak at wall to wall alley, isn't it? It's the alley film. It is. It's it's just, there's just so much in there. I mean, all that film could have been sponsored by IWI, the guys that make the Uzi. <laughs> like, there's so many shots of them just like looking into the distance, holding an Uzi. The like, promotional shot. For all the effort they put into some really cool k- k- weapons, no weapons training. No. Burton has to <laughs> no. look at it all the time. He's just, you know. The good part about that is, obviously, I think the, the key characters know what they're doing, but then some of the lads in the background are a bit bit questionable. A bit. And, you know, yeah, just a, just a little. Some, definite sort of some, some lads that are, are, are the wrong side of 40 in that, in that group, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sandy's weapons handling, while looks a little bit janky because he isn't using the stock and he's sort of like gripping that that stelling for 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 dear life. <laughs> yeah, that's that center mass hold where he's got it in his eye line, but isn't actually like looking over the sides. Is is a recognized um, method of of uh, point shooting. That's good. Shooting. Yeah. yeah, and you would know because you wrote a book on the sterling. <laughs> Available, yeah. just about might maybe available in time for Christmas, folks. We don't know. Um, <laughs> it's out. It's out now. All available. Does it have a stormtrooper chapter. <laughs> I do mention that, and I my my theory on stormtroopers and their terrible accuracy is the fact that they never use the stock. Okay, that's why yeah. they can't hit anyone. At historical firearms, if you want to purchase a copy from the author, um, <laughs> it's not a, it's not a plug if there's context. No, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> no. There's at I least three sterlings. It... We're, we're, we're talking yeah. about the weapons training. I think, for me, it's a good time to mention what is often the the stick people use to beat the wild geese with is the fact all the actors are too old. And I don't think that's a fair argument because 
they're not pretending they're not. The point is they mm. are ex guys. They're not yeah. meant to be running around for. They're not going to be meant to be going there for three weeks. It's just it's not an four extended hours. tour. It's four hours on the ground. Yeah, exactly. If you think of the same year, nineteen seventy eight. So that's Force Ten from Navarone. So Robert Shaw forty eight. Edward Fox was you know forty something rather. That's different because they're meant to be frontline soldiers in yeah. the war. So to me, James Coburn. Cross of Iron was like 48, 49, playing a sergeant in the German army in the Eastern Front. That, to me, is when you can genuinely criticise actors being too old. But in The Wild Geese, that, that's, read the book again. The, the point is they're not pretending they're 20 years old. That's not why they're there. They're, they're yeah. there because they know what they, do, they can do. They are all reliable. That's the thing. The, the, the movie and the, the, the movie less than the book. But the movie hints that Falker needs to have 50 guys who he can absolutely depend on, that yeah. they know what to do, they know how to fire their weapons, they know what they're doing, they're not going to run away at the first sense of danger. But yeah, sure, they're going to be 40-something, 50-something. So I know a couple of guys around in my kind of neck of the woods who are in that age group who still do security work in different countries and so and they're not going there because they run fast. They go there to oversee and 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 provide expertise based mm. on their years so i i find that criticism of the wild geese unv- invalid i don't think it's a, yeah it's no a, i totally it's agree enti- that entirely yeah. relevant and look what they do they don't have to cover much distance they're the the, the skydive presumably they're, you know, they're all jump qualified there's nothing different special for it they're all there they've got to move a couple of miles over a couple of hours what's the what's the beef about them being a bit older there's no it, it doesn't make a difference at all they're there for their skills and the way they execute we're going back to the plot again the way they execute the airfield uh takeover and the and the, the barrack room is is perfect i mean it's, yeah, just, it's great it's about the best demonstration on film of a, of a set piece that you've trained isn't it it, it goes yeah. absolutely like clockwork do you think the argentines watched that and used it as inspiration for the invasion of the falklands attack on the barracks possibly possibly <laughs> they could have had some silent sterlings couldn't they for those lads they in the could have, that would have that would have been a great inclusion some or some mac 10s there is a mac 10 at the beginning of the film yeah there is the uh, yeah, the, well, the, one of the, um, the mafia guys it doesn't yeah mean, exactly uh, one of the hitmen yeah. uh mac 10 with a with a suppressor on it that would have been very alley Talking of those mafia guys, right? Mm-hmm. Do you reckon they are the wines, the actors who came along for roles as the mercies? But no, no, you, you <laughs> really, old. you're not quite. You really do look shit. <laughs> you know, some of these other guys, they look a bit shit. Ronald Fraser's pushing it, but you really do look. So, but we'll give you the we'll give you the secondary role of mafia you can, guy. You can be a beginning. fat hitman. You could be a fat number hit three man who gets killed by a grenade. <laughs> When we were doing our live tweet of this last night, someone commented that you know the grenade didn't kill enough of them. I was like, no, I think I think getting three out of ten, like it's six bad, or seven, yeah. was pretty good. That's, that's yeah, it's not a film that sort of over eggs the, the the capabilities of a hand grenade, I suppose. No, but I do love that scene where I'm just going to go back to where Rafer punches through the door and just like drops a grenade through. I just that's just such a good he scene. He drops it in such an odd way as well. He just like such an open, like, just uh, opens like... his hand, doesn't he? And just like drops yeah. it. It's so good. And yet the door, their doors miraculously not even touched by the explosion, which is incredible for a grenade. <laughs> that, that that just raises questions about just how strong a punch Richard Harris could, <laughs> yeah. could muster, you know, to get through a door that can withstand a hand grenade. Yeah, but I it, think 1970s bed sits above the dodgy casino doors. I don't think that that's going to be your <laughs> IKEA. 15 quid, <laughs> MFI 15 quid yeah. doors you get. So that's def- that's yeah. definitely an MDF the door. Ones with the, the ones with the kind of zigzaggy cardboard in the middle. That's, that's yeah. what those doors are. <laughs> um, so I suppose we should move on to favourite scenes. Yeah, we should. And and discuss some of our favourite bits. So, as you're the guest, Paul, would you like to kick off? Well, I mean, two, but I mean, if I can just go for one, it just has to be the running for the aircraft scene at the end, which is just from about the moment Richard Harris runs with the Vickers to the Richard Burton turning to Roger Moore and saying, I killed Rafer. I don't think there's a wasted second in that sequence. I don't know how long mm. that bit is. Let's say it's seven or eight minutes. That and the, and the, even the blood spurt that comes up and hits the lens when uh, Richard Harris gets killed. That is a really, really well filmed, beautifully planned, beautifully shot, beautifully tense film a sequence 
that yeah. I think elevates that film to something really special. Totally agree. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. It's the payoff to it's all the all that um, the building of re- relationships. You know, the narrative where it's leading to, and and you're right, it, it is shot really nicely. I mean, the whole film shot really really nicely. Yeah. Uh, mm. In terms of cinematography, you know, you get that sort of feeling of moving through brush and jungle um it, you know has that kinetic pace to it during the firefight scenes the set piece battle through the village uh is is really great mm. you know you get a you get a sense of scale um which to adds to the so like the climax of the film it's sandy's death then you know then rafer is shot by richard burton and you know it's and just just that scene where the you know he, he comes back to the cockpit and he just says i, I shot I shot rafer yeah, I shot, I shot yeah. genders. You know, it's just, yeah, it's it's a, it's a great. That's a great choice. What about you, Robbie? When they're clearing the uh, the the airport, I like that a mm. lot. You've got Sandy and the rest of the lads. They like un- they uncover all the the Simbas having their having their lunch yeah. in that cafeteria, little bar, and then they and they all just open up on them. I think it's great. You know, it's just unashamedly action. The bits where Roger Moore's just being James Bond, shooting everyone with a silenced pistol. That's really yeah. good as well. He's like sat there smoking a cigar, and like someone turns around the corner, he's like, pew, pew, just, yeah, just drops him. Yeah, yeah. I just love movies where Roger Moore isn't in a Bond film, but he's having to be Bond because it's expected of him. Yeah, there's a few of those, isn't there? Well, if you read if you read Roger Moore's book for autobiography, and if you look at the uh, the, the documentaries as well, he's uh, he was explaining that he felt overawed by having to act against Richard Burton and Richard Harris and, and, Sh- and Shona and Carney. So he thought, mm. I'll do my stick, which my stick is the kind of the raised eyebrow kind of quip. Yeah. Um, bonster. So that's, that was his, that was his defense against, he can't out act them. So he can like kind a of out mechanism. Them. Right. So that's what he did. And so I can, I can imagine because he was, he was the one that was the best friend with you and Lloyd, the producer. That I reckon he was the one who kind of steered the way those scenes went and said, "Look, I don't give me the heavy dialogue, don't give me the exposition, give me the quips, and give me the the kind of the, the quirky kind of kills, and I'll I'll make that work for you." Yeah, and and let the others do the heavy hit, the heavy lifting, if you like. I think it's needed, though, isn't it? His character is definitely needed. I mean, he is the he is the perfect foil for the more serious uh, Harris and Burton characters. I love it when he makes that lad eat the bag of cocaine. It's just, it's just so funny to me. <laughs> when he's just going, oh, oh, please don't. You know, that's what she don't said. Don't think about a stomach pump. There was strychnine in there. <laughs> like, wow, now okay. eat. <laughs> that's quite a sick way to plan to kill someone, yeah, isn't it? Is. it? Yeah. Paul Roger Moore's kind of jokiness in the film. He's planned that. He that he hasn't thrown that together. He's saying, I'm gonna get that guy, right? How could I I'll put the cocaine, I'll make him eat it, and I'll put I mean that that that's pretty high level bastardry that is. Bond wouldn't do that though. Oh, Bond, oh, God. That Good books, Lord. That book's your theory on that one, Robbie. Like Bond would not force someone to eat a lot of coke. Bond would sleep with a with, with the drug dealer, wouldn't he? <laughs> 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 and convert him to the cause. Yeah. <laughs> go on matt what's yeah. your what's your favorite oh i don't it's it's very difficult like i mean those are two great picks and there's a lot of standout scenes in the actual you know the film i really enjoy the the set piece of the moving through the village i think that's a, a really a great scene you know it, they're these retired very well trained uh former soldiers you know they're experts they're mercenaries and Although we get glimpses of them in action, like throughout the film, obviously we're following more Burton and the rest of them. But that final sequence, we get more of you know the rest of the of the company. So you you have like um, Ian Yule on the the blindy side and the Bren. You've got Esposito. You've got Sandy holding fire until the, the you know you can see the whites of their eyes like the very last moment. You know, and you get that sort of like feel that these these are like professionals. You know, they are hardened professionals and you know you see them bounding you see them laying down fire you see you know they're moving the vicar's gun around to where it's best you know it's it's professional sort of like soldiering vibe that Mm. is like created by that scene and i think that pays off the establishment of all of these characters as you were saying earlier paul on the bridge they're all kind of like 10 minutes of not knowing what the hell they're doing (laughs) just sort of like headless chickens on the bridge which doesn't really befit 
the you know the 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 vibe and the the the, the essence of of what these men are you know they're professional yeah former soldiers mercenaries you know they they would have they would have instantly known what to do on that bridge and that bridge mm. is also an honorable mention that scene with the plane that's really cool it is good well done yeah i like that it it's a great little sequence and i think to, to add to what you said about the village i think is what makes that scene so good is it's grounded in what these men could actually achieve. It doesn't go mm. into kind of expendables territory where you know your six heroes are going to come out of it by standing there in Schwarzenegger style, Willis, Stallone, and just kill. They are completely outnumbered. They are running mm. at low of ammo. Um, and, and it shows you in that predicament. They, they are, they're yeah. acting professionally, but they're acting professionally in a situation that is not going to get, they're not all going to get out of it. And they know that they absolutely, and you as the audience know it, they're not all going to make it. You, they're, they're doing everything they can to limit the deaths and they're doing it to save those to get the aircraft, but you know, it's not going to end well. And that's mm. why, although it's kind of got that slight fantasy element to it, there's this grounding in what men can actually achieve with weaponry. They don't, no weapon achieves anything in that movie that can't actually be achieved by a weapon. I would kind of argue, you know, very true. That's a good point to jump off on to mention the comparisons that people often make of it with Expendables and that kind of film. Like people describe it as sort of like a proto Expendables. I, I really don't agree with that. Like the Expendables are a comic book esque sort of like yeah yeah yeah. They don't exude that you know that hardened professional soldier vibe at any point in any of those films for me. Because in Expendables, they're all playing like characters they've played before so stallone's playing rambo um mm-hmm. you know arnie's being terminator bruce willis is being john mcclain in um in in die hard and and they reference it like a lot that's the whole point of them films i think it's like oh mm. look we were in 80s action films but yeah it's a whole shtick and yeah, yeah. wild it's... geese is more self-aware in the fact the expendables are great films but they're they're in a sense they're complete fantasy escapism shoot em up silly mm. unrealistic popcorn switch brain off film and wild geese has an element of that it's considered i think as a throwaway film but actually as we go back to the serious points it makes about racism and african inequality and stuff and what mm-hmm. web it is grounded in a kind of realistic sense that that that, yeah. that i think perhaps that's why it's a b-move that's why it didn't become a name of because it didn't go into kind of bond silliness the mission is not yeah. successful they don't come out with their money uh limbani is not put back in he, you know he's dead it's a failure it is it's a failure um and most of the people die so that realism whereas if it was an a if it was a blockbuster you never go into a bond film thinking bond is going to die at the end of it do you You're... no you don't no very true so i think that's what makes wild geese um a little bit different is that you know if you haven't you know i can't imagine there are people who haven't ever seen it before but you if you haven't seen it before you are going to be surprised at the way it, the plot developed because if you come at it from a 21st century action hero perspective, you know the one person's going to die. So there's always the noble death of one person mm-hmm. or wounded, but you don't expect to see most of the cast get wiped out. It's That's very true. It does book that trend of, you know, the stereotype of there just being one noble death. Clearly, it's not a film that's pulling any punches. You know, it's hitting hard where it can on, uh, as you mentioned, African inequality, uh, the foibles of capitalism, with uh, with um, Stuart Granger's character, yeah, and I think the the writing of the film is such that you get a feel for these these characters, and you know that they're 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 willing to to die for the mission because that's what they've signed up for, and they're professional yeah. soldiers. So you don't have this stupid comic book sort of um, made for the the video game generation, as they I hate that phrase, but that's you know one of the yeah, we one know of what you mean. things. Yeah things about um expendables that i hate where it, there is no real oomph to the plot there's no real yeah. narrative um there's no taken risk. as well you know those yeah. kind of films where like it's just a a straight bolt um sort of like plot with no real oomph or essence or body to it whereas with with wild geese you know you become attached to characters that you wouldn't expect to become attached to in a film if they made it now they made a remake of wild geese now which god forbid they ever do today's hollywood blockbuster screenwriters wouldn't be able to no. to create the sort of essence that that wild geese has 
they have talked about remaking it. There's lots of forums where you see people's ideal cast for remakes. And yeah. that actually got as far as I think a, a script. great pub chat, though, isn't it? Working out who you'd have in it. Yeah, because Roger Moore was talking about coming back as the Stuart Granger character. Yeah, that, that was good, one yeah. one car about ten years ago or so, which would have been an interesting an interesting twist potentially. But I don't think you can you can improve on it. It is you what have it to is. Go and say President Limbani, please. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. That movie, and it's got you know, it's it, it's not perfect by any means. There's three Wilhelm screams: one on the bridge, one when the the, the Simba after the river that Burton shoots in the throat, I and the third one I think in the village. So there's three three of them. Yeah, he just he has that that second one has that very dramatic like death fall, doesn't he? He's like, ah! like yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's I mean the, the other the other amazing scene by the way is the sky the, the, the skydive and the music for that, which is not the same theme they run through the film. Um, da, 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 that's just yeah. a great. Scene. It's like a circus theme. It's like a parade, circus parade. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 as I said at the beginning, I've I've seen it fifty or sixty times, and I I watch it twice a year at least. I never don't enjoy it. I always love it. I, I get niggled by little bits in it, but I just it it just does what a movie should do. It 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 it, it takes you on a journey, and even and it's when it's like like having your favorite song. You 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 yeah. you, you sing along with it now. Mm. It's I'm thank you for inviting me to come and talk about it because I just love it. Well, we knew you would really you would offer something that would be you know uh, g- give us a little bit more insight because we we know you've uh, probably got it on like six different formats and I've had it video, DVD, Blu-ray. So it's only the three for that one, yeah. Okay, uh, and the book. Don't forget, so four. And the book, yeah, yeah. We just love hearing about other people's experiences with a movie because obviously you know it's me and Matt every week, and and we don't have any other people sort of to sound ideas off on, on or anything like that so it's nice to have a third input for i a, think it's also a little bit slightly generational thing as well it's yeah like, that, you know, yeah it's like yeah. I, I, because of my age roger moore is my bond it doesn't mean he's the mm. best bond but he's the bond that i went and saw at the cinema so i don't like too much roger moore bashing because that was my that was where I saw that. Yeah. I saw the but the. Sean I don't Connery think there's anything the to TV. bash Roger Moore about in this he, film at all. No, he really no. comes off really well in this movie. I think he's great in this film. Mm. Yeah, no, he's he's you know he's thoroughly believable as a slight. You know, let's be honest, as a more realistic character than Bond, isn't he? he you know, much you more. get the impression that he is much more ruthless in this, and he is you know he, and the thirty thousand quid he's going to get for it, which when you're watching it now doesn't sound like that much to risk your money for. Although this year with COVID, I'd risk my ass for thirty thousand quid. That, but yeah, <laughs> I'll do but, it tomorrow. Um, <laughs> What are the things about the film that niggle you, that annoy you? You go that mm. just you know they could have improved on that, or just you know plot holes or something because it's not perfect. Um, For me, it's the the lack of suppressed stalings. <laughs> there should there should be some there should be some L thirty four A ones or Mark sixes in there. Should be. I think that that would have been that would have added to the alley tally in a significant way for me. I think for me possibly, I wish there was some like tanks in it or some armored cars they could have stolen a, a like a apc or something to help could them have been out. a little ferret in there or something couldn't there at the airport perhaps take it out take it out with the blinded side i think it might have benefited from yeah like a daimler ferret or a you know salad in armored car or something that would have been really cool yeah it's just a little something i think going off what, what you said earlier paul i think what, what a good inclusion would have been a little bit more of the sort of back and forth between uh kruger and limbani now i know it's been cut it'd be nice to yeah see exactly it. like yeah, yeah, now, yeah. now that you've mentioned that that was was cut mm-hmm. out um y- you feel the loss more like you feel like it should be in there there should be a little bit more and while it does the job it gets across what they're trying to say in a succinct way i think they could probably have included a little bit more of that maybe one or two more conversations just like short bits back and forth so i think that would have been improved like the the heft mm. of the film on that side and you might have felt a bit more I'm not saying Lim- Limbani is a MacGuffin character, but when he passes away in the plane, I don't really feel, I don't feel much emotion with his death, but I feel loads no. of emotion for Rafer and loads of emotion for Sandy, but n- mm. not a lot for Limbani. And, and I wish, you know, if they'd have said more, if he'd have had more to say when he was up for speaking to Karuga, maybe I'd have felt more for his character and his plight a little bit more. That's a good point, actually, because I, I don't, I'm not moved when he died. I had never thought that. Somehow I don't invest myself in him in the same way. I mean, mm. he was in a sh- shit spot before the movie started. He's already in prison, <laughs> and he's already ill. So it's, it's, it, 
kind of it's expected, I suppose, that he's the fragile one. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like when I watched it for the first time, I didn't think, oh yeah, he's going to die. No, I thought he'd get out. Mm. I did, yeah. And as I said, like you wouldn't think it would be a gunshot wound that would get the guy with the heart condition. <laughs> you know, he's both poor guys like dragged through half a dozen gun battles, and you know that's what gets him in the mm. end. Um, he probably would have been safer in the cell if they weren't <laughs> going to ex- execute him. But mm. um, but they only get the poor guy a stretcher in the last maybe five ten minutes of the movie, and then the rest of the way they're just dragging this poor bloke along. Sorry, uh, that niggles me a bit. Yeah, he's like he's so important. I have another question for you, and it's it's one that's niggled me. Is right at the beginning when Richard Burton. Now that the first thing is is the fact that they must have decided after the film was shot that they were going to have it concord as the aircraft it comes in which mm. is why they dub him saying because richard they said apart from a very rushed meal on the plane he obviously said shit or crap or foul but because they now show concord it can only be british airways so they have to change it to a very rushed meal watch it again yeah. you'll notice he dubbing that did you notice that that no. you'll notice it now right the second my, that's one point the thing is, is the barry foster character the band of Alk, the blonde curly haired guy the the guy who works for Stuart granger my question is, who the fuck is he, right? Because he works for a merchant banker, and then when Richard Burton says to him, I can't do this, and there's these two names, and he says, Ray Fajandas, and Barry Foster goes, yeah, blonde hair, cigarette glass, cigarette case glass. Now, Ray Fajandas hasn't been a mercenary for 10 years, right? That's They established that when, but who is Barry Foster? That out of his brain, he can tell, as a, he knows ex-mercenaries were 10 years old living in London. Maybe now this is this is a theory. This is this might become your your head cannon for this, Paul. Maybe his son goes to school with Emil. Oh, maybe he's Emil's father because he's got the curly hair. Maybe oh. he's. <laughs> but, that, but you know, I understand he's kind of the the fixer guy for Stuart, and 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 it's suggesting that big bad businessmen have these kind of shady kind of. Yeah, he does. He he probably does know a little bit too much. But he knows the two guys, per, you know, oh, Sean Finn. Oh, I know the name of Sean Finn. How do you know these guys? London's a big bloody place. What merchant bankers have in their heads a list of former mercenaries? And also, by the way, just on that subject, the, the fact that Richard Burton and Richard Harris haven't seen each other for 10 years in a movie and they're suddenly best mates again. Because the book, they've been working on opera, they've been together much more recently, more frequently. I don't mm. understand why they have this 10-year gap and suddenly they're best mates again. They're not no Christmas cards, no Rafer. Suddenly they're back in again and he wants, are the 10 years of no contact, look after my kid for me if I die. That's my little question I have with that movie. It makes no difference to the plot. One other little thing that I, I do like about that scene where he lands is he's sat in just before customs, like drinking his duty free. Uh, and, yeah. Underneath a very 70s rabies can kill poster. <laughs> he's, <Yeah. laughs> he's got like his little paper cup and he's clearly like drinking something from duty free. When, when we and Matt watched it the, the other night, I was like, no, that, that's not a genuine take. That's just Richard Burton drinking. <laughs> they just happened to be on set. <laughs> Yeah, but we'll be with you certain, certain, soon, Mr. Burton. Just, yeah, if I, I'll sit here with my paper bag of, of gin. Yeah. <laughs> did I tell you I narrated War of the Worlds? Yes, you did. Get back to your gin. <laughs> now, would, would, the, question, the question, would you have liked to have seen the sequel with Richard Burton? Because, I mean, the sequel did happen, but he died. Mm. If Richard Burton had done it, not Edward Fox, would it, could it have saved itself? Could it have been a decent movie? Or was it always destined to be crap? I think the plot of that one is always going to destine it to be pretty poor there's no there's none of there's none of what makes wild geese special in wild geese 2 i think i've not seen it so i can't i can't comment so the, the peril isn't there the danger mm. the being away it's 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 in a city in europe is not it just seems like if it, if it fails you're going to get arrested that's how it as opposed to you know get to get to stern talking to yeah i think wild geese 2 for me is much like die hard 4 onwards just does not exist mentally so I guess that, that, that rounds us out nicely um, I think it does. for our discussion on The Wild Geese. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Paul. I've, I've enjoyed it. I'm sorry I've rabbited too much, but yeah, I just, I, I love the film. I never cease to like enjoy it. Like, like you said, Paul, I never like cease to, to find new things or, or enjoy the bits that I've enjoyed before unashamedly. Like it's just, it's just a good movie. It entertains. It, 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 it does the primary purpose of entertaining you 
Merry Christmas to all our all our listeners. Yeah, we're really grateful to everyone who subscribed, everyone who's uh, given us a review or, or or shared the podcast around. Really means a lot. Happy New Year to everybody as well. And uh, don't forget to give us a like, subscribe, share the pod with all your friends on whatever device you're you're listening on. And you can find us on Twitter at Fighting On Film. Thanks again for coming on, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Bye-bye. Bye.